You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B.L. Purdom. Episode 6, A Murder of Crones. We'll begin this episode with a quote from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 10, Luna Lovegood. The girl gave off an aura of distinct naughtiness. Perhaps it was the fact that she had stuck her wand behind her left ear for safekeeping, or that she had chosen to wear a necklace of butterbeer caps, or that she was reading a magazine upside down. The archetypal crone is usually embodied by female characters, like the archetypal mother, but neither the attributes of the mother nor the crone are truly tied to gender or age. Hagrid's behavior and activities, such as being a caretaker to both Harry and his interesting creatures, make him an archetypal mother, and Hermione's actions make her an archetypal mother, not her age or being a literal mother, though she does become that in the third book when she adopts Crookshanks. A crone isn't just any old woman. The crone sees across barriers, sees what others cannot. The crone is a conduit between worlds, so it's entirely appropriate that the crone is the ruling archetype of the fifth book in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, the book in which he first confronts death. Many myths, religions, and folk customs say that the one who gives life also takes it. The crone is a guide to accepting the end of life, and she's a repository of wisdom about death. She can be benevolent, but on occasion she kills. When Luna Lovegood first appears, though she's in the same year in school as Ginny Weasley, she's described very much like a classic crone. She has light hair that sounds close to white, and she seems a little addled, saying odd things at odd times. But in spite of other characters thinking she isn't all there, she's shrewd and observant. She seems to remember Ron's Yule Ball experience better than he does, for instance. Like Harry and Neville, Luna can see Thestrals, which fits with the crone's connection to death. Luna's conversation with Harry at the end of the fifth book is key because she alone, as a guide to death, offers him the solace and guidance to consider what death really means. This is from chapter 38 of Order of the Phoenix. Harry speaks first. Has anyone you've known ever died? Yes, said Luna simply. My mother. She was a quite extraordinary witch, you know, but she did like to experiment, and one of her spells went rather badly wrong one day. I was nine. I'm sorry, Harry mumbled. Yes, it was rather horrible, said Luna conversationally. I still feel very sad about it sometimes, but I've still got Dad, and anyway, it's not as though I'll never see Mom again, is it? Luna is the one who thinks of using Thestrals to fly to the Ministry to try to rescue Sirius. They can only be seen by someone who's seen death, and they're considered bad luck, but in this case, it's an advantage that Luna can see them. J.K. Rowling has called Luna the anti-Hermione, like matter and antimatter, more physics terminology. Both girls have attributes that are inverted in the other. Luna is a Ravenclaw in spite of her slight spaciness. Rowling says she is, quote, prepared to believe a thousand impossible things before breakfast, unquote, a paraphrase of Lewis Carroll, who used games, toys, and looking glasses in ways similar to Rowling's. Luna becomes a sort of honorary Gryffindor when she wears a lion's head hat to support Gryffindor during a Quidditch match, and at the Ministry in the fifth book, she displays Gryffindor-like bravery. Hermione seems like an anomaly in Gryffindor. She was considered Ravenclaw material by the Sorting Hat, but she chose Gryffindor. Each girl has elements of the other's house in her personality, and seems like a fish out of water in her own house. Luna has an almost unlimited capacity to believe. Hermione likes hard facts. But in the fifth book, Hermione starts to take things on faith, including prophecies, while Luna ponders how to get to the Ministry and produces a profoundly logical solution. Thestrals, which are a solid, visible fact to Luna, but Hermione has to make a leap of faith to ride a Thestral. Rowling's depiction of Luna can seem odd until she's placed in the context of the crone, a link between this world and the next, just as some of Hermione's choices are more clearly illuminated when we see her as an archetypal mother. Dumbledore calls death the next great adventure, a paraphrase from Peter Pan, who said, To die will be an awfully big adventure. 
The fifth book is the first one in which Harry confronts death head-on, so it's appropriate that she has her debut in Order of the Phoenix. In the maiden-mother crone trio of the Black Sisters, Andromeda is the maiden and Narcissa is the mother. Bellatrix Lestrange is the crone in the trio. Bellatrix embodies the darkest aspect of the crone, the hand that cuts the thread of life. In contrast, Luna has seen death, but she certainly hasn't dealt it. She's regularly victimized by fellow students who steal her stuff to prank her. There's no inkling that she wants to exact vengeance on the people who did this. She accepts the situation as she accepts the end of life. Another attribute that's associated with crones is an abrupt, non-sequitur-laden pattern of speech. Listeners can often think that they're being insulted or demeaned, or like they're having one conversation and the crone is having another. Bellatrix's speech verges on hysteria when she and her sister Narcissa visit Snape in the sixth book, Half-Blood Prince, and also when she speaks in a babyish mocking voice to Harry at the Ministry. On the other hand, Luna often disarms people because she speaks uncomfortable truths without batting an eye, or she just talks about whatever interests her at the moment. When most people want to know what's happening during a Quidditch match that she's commentating, she reports on cloud formations rather than which side has scored. Bellatrix seems more than a little off. Maybe it's from the Dementors in Azkaban, or perhaps they simply didn't help, since we get to see her in Dumbledore's Poncive before she's imprisoned, and she's not exactly a shining example of level-headedness at that time. Luna is also considered not quite with it because of some of the things she believes. Even those who like her best are at a loss when she talks about crumple-horned snorkaks or blubbering humdingers. But this is just another aspect of the archetypal crone. The crone is on the threshold to another world and can see things others cannot. But as Ron tells Harry in the second book, hearing voices others don't isn't considered a good thing even amongst wizards. Certainly seeing things others don't see, or believing in creatures no one else has heard of, can't be seen in a much better light. Another crone character who speaks with mystical awe of seeing what others don't, and takes pride in it, is Sybil Trelawney. Unlike Bellatrix, she hasn't made a habit of killing people, just predicting Harry's untimely death a number of times each term. She also doesn't seem to share Luna's equanimity about death. She is very alarmed when Harry and Ron stand first from a table of 13 people during Prisoner of Azkaban. She's certain that their deaths will come before everyone else's at the table because of this. Her connection to death is that she sees death, or thinks she does, before it occurs. Harry drops divination because her favorite activity during his lessons is predicting his death. She's just plain wrong time and again, but she did correctly predict Wormtail's return to Voldemort's service and the prophecy she gave during her job interview interested Voldemort so much that he attempted to kill Harry because of it. This same prophecy is the reason that Voldemort wants to get Harry to the Ministry throughout the fifth book. Trelawney's pronouncements, like Luna's, make others uncomfortable, which is one reason that she usually remains in her tower. In many myths and fairy tales, a tower is an axis mundi, a conduit between worlds. Trelawney's tower is a physical symbol of her being able to link worlds. She's also considered a few cards short of a tarot deck, like Bellatrix and Luna, and her classroom sounds like a stereotypical old woman's sitting room, fussy and overfurnished. In the books, Trelawney could be elderly, youngish, or middle-aged. We can't really tell, but it's irrelevant. She's an archetypal crone. She believes what others are unwilling or unable to believe, says uncomfortable things, and bridges worlds. She's not actually called a medium, which is someone who can channel spirits, but does many things that mediums do, which is another connection to death. The first crone in Harry's life was another dotty old woman, from his perspective, Mrs. Fig. As a squib, Mrs. Fig has no magic herself, but she can access the wizarding world, which most non-magical people cannot. Her fussy, smelly home is not unlike Trelawney's classroom. She speaks her mind, and she's a link between worlds, the wizarding and the muggle worlds, rather than the living and the dead. 
However, for Harry, this is a metaphorical link between life and death, because she's a connection, though he doesn't know this until Order of the Phoenix, between the muggle and wizarding worlds, between his muggle life and his dead parents. In myths and folktales, a crone watches over the hero during childhood. This may be why Mrs. Fig breaks a leg in the first book. Harry is about to find out that he is a wizard and enter Hogwarts, so the crone watching over him is no longer needed. She surfaces again when he is vulnerable to being metaphorically aborted by Umbridge, which is analogous to Voldemort trying to kill him as a baby. A rather prominent character embodies many attributes of the crone except for being neither elderly nor female, Severus Snape. The name of his home, Spinner's End, strongly evokes the Harsh Spinners, which is another name for the Three Fates. His name, Severus, could refer to his severing the thread of Dumbledore's life. The frequent bat imagery used in conjunction with his character was thought for a while by some fans to point to his either being a vampire or just a bat animagus. However, like Ginny's bat bogey hex, this could instead be evoking the bat wings of the Furies, who are also related to the Fates and who were chiefly invoked to avenge parricide, but especially matricide, the killing of a mother. And what is Snape's motive for everything he does after Halloween in 1981? the murder of Harry's mother. He teaches in a dungeon underground, and during Harry's first potions lesson, he says he can bottle death, that in essence, he has control over life and death. This is particularly true in reference to Dumbledore's life, which is prolonged by Snape when the cursed ring threatens it. He also provides Dumbledore's death when Dumbledore asks him to. Snape's home is in a town that seems remarkably like a circle of hell. All that's missing is sulfur and brimstone. He goes back and forth between the world of the living and a metaphorical world of the dead as a spy for Dumbledore and a supposed Death Eater. When he's abusive to Harry, Neville, or other students, he appears less than sane and far more interested in vengeance than listening to reason. And no matter how Luna or Trelawney try, no one can say uncomfortable things as well as Snape, who finds exactly the comment about James Potter that is guaranteed to make Harry's blood boil. Like Luna and Trelawney, Snape sees what others cannot, but in his case it's through legitimacy. Harry is even less thrilled by Snape seeing his memories of the past than Trelawney seeing doom and gloom in his future, and after overhearing part of Trelawney's prophecy during her job interview, which Snape reports to Voldemort, the Potters are targeted. Ever since, Snape has dwelt upon the past, seemingly determined to arrest his own development, voluntarily interring himself in an underground burial chamber of sorts, surrounded by reminders of death. Harry must come to terms with archetypal crones who remind him of what Voldemort fears, death. A crone, Bellatrix, kills Sirius, the wise old man who means the most to Harry in the fifth book, and another crone, Snape, kills Dumbledore, another wise old man close to Harry in the sixth. Harry attempts to torture each of the culprits with the Cruciatus curse, but both times he fails. Now, I heard about a theory that Snape is trans. I thought, Snape being a trans man doesn't change the plot. Sure, why not? To clarify, a trans man is assigned or assumed to be female at birth, but decides that he's male. Then I found out that the theory is that Snape is a trans woman, based in part on the writing in the Half-Blood Prince's book, Looking Feminine, Snape wearing what looks like a woman's blouse in a childhood memory, and Neville's Bogart becoming a facsimile of Snape dressed as his grandmother. Again, I don't see why readers can't see Snape as a trans man or a trans woman. It has no impact on the plot. However, one detail might actually be a clue to Snape's archetype, Neville's Bogart. The Weasley twins appear as literal wise old men in Goblet of Fire when they grow long white beards, and Hermione becomes a literal mother by adopting Crookshanks. J.K. Rowling may be pointing to Snape's archetype by presenting him as a literal crone, dressing him like Neville's grandmother, a literal and figurative crone. Is it likely that this or other evidence for Snape being a trans woman is actually that? Unlikely, but again, it's the reader's choice. 
My personal interpretation of the Bogart is that it's most likely linked to Snape's archetype, not gender identity. I believe that Rowling is again subverting archetypes by giving us a nominally male character with the crone's attributes. Harry must reconcile all three female archetypes to be a whole and true hero. He accomplishes this with maidens and mothers by the end of the sixth book, in which he has a relationship with a maiden, Ginny, and finally learns about his mother's legacy. What remains is his reconciliation with the crone, specifically Snape. Viewing the memories that Snape gives him as he dies is what finally prepares Harry to go into the forest, walking to his death. Maiden, Mother, and Crone are a whole, just as the Deathly Hallows are a whole. Harry finally understanding the Crone is what makes him a whole person and, ultimately, Master of Death. channels or steps into the shoes of the person who best embodies the ruling archetype in each previous book. First, he's a surrogate for the wise old man Dumbledore in Philosopher's Stone. Then he repeats the actions of Ginny, the maiden, in Chamber of Secrets. He travels through time like the archetypal mother Hermione in Prisoner of Azkaban. And he goes from being a shadow champion to Cedric, an archetypal father, to being the sole Hogwarts champion at the end of Goblet of Fire. Harry does this again in Order of the Phoenix, in which three characters compete for best crone. The first is Luna. Her father's tabloid, The Quibbler, is a perfectly good publication to her. By the book's end, Harry agrees. Harry and Luna also see what others cannot, Thestrals. And finally, Luna helps Harry cope with Sirius's death by talking to him about her mother's death. The second crone is Snape. He sees what others cannot through legitimacy and tries to teach Harry occlumency, so Voldemort cannot infiltrate Harry's mind. However, Harry sees into Voldemort's mind without legitimacy, since he's the unintentional Horcrux. Snape and Harry each have a kind of second sight, though Snape does legitimacy intentionally, and Harry does something similar unintentionally. Harry also shares some attributes of Bellatrix Lestrange. After she kills Sirius, Harry tries to put Cruciatus on her. Other than the killing curse, this could be seen as her signature move. It's why Neville's parents are in St. Mungo's, and she uses this spell on Neville himself in the Department of Mysteries. Oddly enough, Harry does not attempt to kill her just after he sees her murder Sirius. Instead, he attempts to channel her with Cruciatus. Order of the Phoenix is rife with archetypal crones. Mrs. Fig, Sybil Trelawney, Luna Lovegood, Bellatrix Lestrange, Severus Snape. In the end, Harry tries but doesn't succeed in being like two of these crones, Snape and Bellatrix. He cannot master occlumency, and he cannot torture, yet. But three times in Order of the Phoenix, Harry channels Luna's way of thinking, and significant developments occur each time that he's able to do this. This includes doing the interview for her father's tabloid, which was considered fake news, but now has news, Harry's interview, that's more real than what's in the Daily Prophet, which in turn is now a state propaganda tool. Harry is also convinced by Luna that Thestrals are the best way to reach the Ministry, which is how the climax of the book is even possible. Finally, Harry believes, after talking to Luna, that death may not be the absolute end of everything, which both helps him to process Sirius's death, and along with seeing Snape's memories, later helps him to find the strength to go into the forest in the seventh book. This is all thanks to Luna Lovegood, the character who best embodies the crone in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, the book ruled by the crone archetype. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B.L. Purdom. Next time on Quantum Harry, Episode 7, Fountain of Youth, 
an exploration of the youth, the ruling archetype of the sixth book in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, and the first archetype embodied by Harry himself. I hope you'll join me.